Hello and good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to uh, you know what I like to call Space Fam. It's always a really great conversation that we have every single Saturday night from 8 p.m. to uh, 10 p.m. MDT. Everybody always hates that uh, that time zone, but I actually have somebody tonight that gets to enjoy it with me. Carolyn's here, so uh, <laughs> somebody that knew it that didn't have to do the. Uh, Wait, is that, is it two or three? It's two, it's fine. Uh, so welcome everybody to the show. Uh, generally, as everybody knows that watches this, we don't really have a typical topic. We kind of jump around to different things. Uh, but Dave Farina, who also uh, from Cosmos Safari has a show here on OPT Telescopes, Clear Skies Network, uh, got a hold of me recently and said, you know what I think would be a great idea. I'd really like to go over, you know, planetariums, um, how they work, a little bit about you know kind of re reintroduce the world to him a little bit um he and i and many of the people on here are working at um museums working at um you know uh, planetarium where a lot of things uh have really kind of stifled the things we're going on to so let's talk a little bit about what's going on and uh tonight i want to talk uh to all these amazing people that i absolutely know nothing about really uh, a few people i've met here and there but uh, dave was not kind enough to uh, get a lot of these folks together and then i pinged my Facebook family and ask them to highlight some really wonderful people that we could bring on the show tonight. And so this is going to be a really fun one. I always like to meet people uh, for the first time in the middle of a show talking about cool stuff that we all love. Um, so I'm going to go to my screen right, left. I don't know. Scott Harris, we're going to go with you uh, first, sir. So give an introduction uh, where you're at and what you do. Hey there. Um, so I'm Scott Harris. I'm the um, staff planetary geologist for Fernbank Science Center and the Jim Cherry Memorial Planetarium in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, as I I'm, have the, the privilege of being a, an active researcher in impact geology, so worrying about comets and asteroids hitting planets, including Earth, but uh, also uh, deal with the public programming of our 71 foot uh, diameter uh, full dome. Uh, in the uh, planetarium and uh, just have a great time with that. And of course, during these interesting times we've been in, uh, have been doing a tremendous amount of virtual programming to, uh, to bring that to people's homes. So it's a uh, thank you for having me uh, here with you guys this evening and uh, look forward to the rest of it. Loving that background, man. Well played. Well played. Dr. Michael, I already forgot how awesome you say your last name. So I'll let you say it again for everybody. Bring it, bring it to us, man. Tell us who you are and what you do. Yes, hi, I'm Dr. Michael Stamatikos. You can call me Mike. And I'm an astrophysicist uh, with NASA. I'm also an assistant professor of astronomy and physics at OSU, uh, Ohio State University. And I also serve as the founding director and chief science officer. Yeah, this, this background. <laughs> oh, Mike, you've got a really big delay, huh? Right, yeah. I, I'm just hearing myself now. <laughs> so, hmm. yeah, we've got some crackling on your end with your audio too. So, okay. do you need me to log out and log back in? That might do that. Go ahead and do that, and then we'll bring you back in, and we'll do your okay. full introduction again. Sometimes Thank we you. just need to do those real quick. Sorry about that. No worries, man. No worries. It's not the first time. <laughs> so, um, Kat, we're going to go to you next. Tell us a little about about who you are, what you do, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Hunt, but you can call me Kat. I'm the manager of Ingram Planetarium in Sunset Beach, North Carolina. Um, I got into planetarium. Uh, I found my way with a very winding path of experiences into science education and science education research. And I focus on how it increases STEM um, involvement. And the planetarium is the perfect place uh, to engage audiences with STEM. So I love it, and I can't wait to share all about it with you. I am so sad to hear about th that now. I lived in Myrtle Beach forever, and right before I left was around the time that I really got into space and science because of Cosmos. And uh, mm -hmm. I had no idea we had anything even close to Myrtle Beach that was that cool. So that uh, that made me, that broke my heart a little bit once I found out. <laughs> Isn't it? I need, to come, I need to come back, say hi to everybody, and I know we have a few other folks that are in uh, South Carolina as well, so we'll talk about that. James C. Alberry, one of, the, one of the few people here that I actually knew because I knew of your show with Dean. Uh, somebody introduced me to it uh, a while back, so tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and um, you know the shows that you used to do and currently do. I know you got a new one on YouTube, I believe. Yes, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm enjoying the whole Brady Bunch look of this. I was Bobby, but now I'm Peter with uh, Dr. <laughs> uh, absent. But 
It's all good. So, um, yes, I am currently the host of an astronomy series on YouTube called The Sky Above Us. And that is an offshoot of what I used to do uh, with PBS down in South Florida. Because I grew up in Miami and I started working at the planetarium in Miami, uh, the Miami Space Transit Planetarium, when I was about 14 years old. And I really, it really sparked my interest in astronomy. I was already interested in astronomy, but working in a planetarium as a teenager was amazing. So I did that for about six years. And I happened to work at that planetarium during the time when Halley's Comet visited. So it was amazing. So when I went to college, I switched my major from engineering to astronomy and physics. And I've been the director of the Kika Silva Plaw Planetarium at Santa Fe College in Gainesville, Florida since October of 2009. So this will be my 11th year there. And I started hosting Stargazers with Dean Regas in 2011 because uh, Jack Horkheimer, the originator of the program, he passed away in August of 2010. So we've been able to share our love of astronomy with people for almost nine years. And once um, WPBT redid the show and they had a new producer and new host, I thought, you know, I hate to just not be able to do this uh, on a large scale anymore. So I said, well, let me go ahead and see if I could produce my own program. And with the help of a couple of my colleagues at Santa Fe College, we were able to put together something pretty nice. And so our next episode is going to be about the Martian opposition. And then we have the one after that is going to be about the blue pumpkin moon, which is going to be our Halloween full moon that we haven't had for 19 years. Yeah, so it'll be a lot of fun. I know this isn't the group that thinks this, but is everybody ready to hear about that? Oh my God, it's Halloween and a full moon in the year 2020. Are we all ready for how, what the things we're going to have to deal with? The moon's going to be turned into an actual pumpkin or some craziness? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we all know it's coming. Dan Zielinski, yeah. let's go to you next, sir. Hello. Uh, yes, my name is Dan Zielinski. I'm the planetarium director at Jinx Public Schools Planetarium. Uh, Jenks is just out, uh, just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we do uh, basic. We're just a high school planetarium, so we do the astronomy labs, first, fifth, eighth graders from this district, and then we're uh, uh, just pretty much the planetarium for this community. So all the nearby schools also bust their kids in. Uh, but we're probably most known for our show production. Uh, we use our student body. Uh, we use the uh, department, music department for comp uh, music composition, art students to create additional art, uh, script writers, animators, automators, and uh, we create planet full dome planetarium shows uh, using our student body. All right, and we have the, the return of... Uh we have the return of the band, and uh, we'll get to you in just a minute here, Mike. Uh, next up, <coughs> excuse me, let's go to Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do, um, the books you write, and you have you have done some really cool things. You're the only person on here other than Dave that I actually know and have followed on social media. So <laughs> I have a little bit more background with you. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I get started in planetariums, oh, gosh, um, probably back in the Triassic, maybe. I don't know. That was uh, in the late 70s, and... I was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado and walked up to Fisk Planetarium and my husband, who is Mark Peterson, who does space music, had been already doing soundtracks for them. So I wanted to be involved with planetariums. And one thing led to another. I got my education degree. I left college, um, went and worked at a newspaper for a while and decided, you know what, I want to go back to school. So I got a job at Fisk Planetarium on the University of Colorado campus, which is where we also got married. And was working there for about a year and a half and decided I really wanted to go back to graduate school. So I'm one of those people that got turned on by the planetarium and that sort of sent me back to school to learn more about astronomy. And right now what I am is the CEO of Loch Ness Productions, which creates planetarium shows, full dome shows. But I also do a lot of other things. You mentioned the books I've written, written or co-authored seven books. And about a few years ago, I started getting involved in creating exhibit exhibits for planetariums and science centers. And the last one I did, the first one I did was for the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. So if you ever go there, that, that's all my words are on the wall. Did one for NASA, did one for one up in uh, Washington State, did another one for the California Academy of Sciences. And the last one I did was for the Shanghai Science and Technology Museum in Shanghai, China, which I think is opening the first part of next year. And so a lot, all of this has been to reach out and teach people about astronomy. I've written probably more than 50 shows. Uh, I've done a lot of online astronomy shows. 
Um, it's, it's just a lot of different things. And all of it is really, I want to write about astronomy. I want to tell people about the stars and the planets and the universe. And so that's what I do. So very awesome. I mean, it's a shame that nobody here has worked on, you know, big shows before in any large cities. This is all new to everybody. So uh, <laughs> Liz, we're going to go to you next. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do. Liz, we can't hear you. We lost you. We cannot. Very strange. We heard you a minute ago. It's going to be one of those nights. We got on, we did an AV check. Everybody was fine, was crystal clear. We could hear everybody. Oh, yeah. Show and no. Yeah, I hear you now. Okay, yay. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> One of those days. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Liz Klimek, I'm a planetarium manager at the Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina Planetarium in Columbia, South Carolina, which is a mouthful. Um, and so I um, I run shows, I create programming, and I'm involved in astronomy education at the State Museum. And I actually started at a, as a volunteer at the University of Nebraska Lincoln at Mueller Planetarium there when I was a physics and astronomy student. Um, and yes, I, um, my first planetarium experience was actually a laser show and that's actually what pulled me into planetariums was actually the laser part more than the astronomy part. And I'm like, Oh, I could do astronomy too. So, um, that made it extra cool. So awesome to have you. Uh, <laughs> let's go to Dave Farina, the man that, uh, put all, helped put all this together. Uh, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Also let people know uh, that maybe um, haven't watched your show on uh, OPT yet, what the show's about. So first off, thanks, Ron, for having uh, this group come together tonight. I think it's uh, absolutely necessary that we get more planetarians on here uh, in the future as well. So I love um, that term, by Dave the way. What's that? Love that term, by the way. So Liz said that earlier, and I've never heard anybody say that before. I love that term. Yeah, planetarians. Um, so... Yeah, I, I'm actually a planetarium director at a high school as well, uh, kind of like Dan. And for the last 13 years, I've been working at the Mannheim Township Planetarium in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I also am a full-time teacher there. And uh, recently, I started doing some planetarium shows on Clear Skies Network here on Twitch, uh, if you guys are watching on Twitch. And on 8, 8 to 9 p.m., on Wednesday nights, I have a one hour block where it's kind of just like an open what's up in the night sky kind of thing, but also having some backup plans. If uh, people have interest in certain things like deep sky objects or a particular constellation that they'd like to find, find or, you know, like the Mars opposition that's coming up. We spoke about that on Wednesday. So it's just meant to be kind of an open forum, kind of like this is where we can discuss things and I use software that we use in the planetariums to display what's up in the night sky and kind of give people a chance to experience that type of thing here on Twitch. Love it, man. Love it. Dr. John Stamos from Full House. Let's try it again. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I think we're back. Uh, we're back live here. So, yeah, Dr. Mike Stamatikos. I'm an astrophysicist by training. I uh, work on a couple of NASA missions over the years. Uh, one's called SWIFT. The other one was called Fermi. I also work on uh, neutrino astronomy with Ice Cube at the South Pole, where I did my PhD thesis. I'm an assistant professor of astronomy and physics at the Ohio State University Regional Campus in Newark. Which oh, wait. Yes, I.O. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and I also am the founding director uh, of the Cytone Planetarium that is actually located in our uh, museum, the Works Museum, and serve as the chief science officer there. So I have I have broad interests in uh, high energy particle astrophysics and uh, education and science communication. So I'm very excited to join this group today. Awesome. Well, I mean, I, I think one, thank you all for joining us tonight. What an incredible group um, from really all over with all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, we got a lot of East Coast here, so I'm glad that we we have some people peppered throughout, you know, that we got a little bit more here in the, in the middle of the country, but glad to have you all. So the first question is for everybody, um, why why for you planetariums? What What is so important about them? So for me, when I first fell in love with space and science, it was Cosmos. Uh, and then afterwards, I started following a little bit more of Neil deGrasse Tyson's career. And um, I went to... Uh, I went to the American Museum of Natural History, absolutely fell in love with the Hayden Planetarium. I said, like, this is great. Went to Griffith and saw the live show, somebody live doing a show. And then um, I ended up here in Colorado Springs uh, on vacation, deciding if I wanted to move here. And I saw somebody on uh, NOAA Science on a Sphere 
doing a tour of the solar system. And I'm like, this is the coolest th thing ever. It's like Cosmos Live. I can tell people about all these cool things. I don't have to have a degree. I can be a volunteer. This is something I can learn. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And uh, you know, now, uh, four years later, I work there full time doing a lot of great things. So I know it's it inspired me a lot. But if there's anybody in particular that wants to go first, why planetariums? Why for you? If you want to raise your hands, fine. However you want to do it. We got a big panel tonight, so I'll let anybody go that wants to. Dan, we're gonna go with you first. Oh, okay. Now we get hands raised. I see you're gonna be, like, you're gonna be okay. that kind of panel for me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine started in college. Uh, I've always been interested in science and, and science education and stuff like that. But uh, Bowling Green State University is where it started for me. Uh, I took. A, I was a, a freshman, and I had to take you know your typical freshman course, and uh, took astronomy. And it was in the planetarium with Dr. Dale Smith and uh, just loved the course. You know, I asked a lot of questions, got an A. And then Dr. Dale Smith came up to me afterwards and said, hey, you know what? I do hire some students to help the planetarium and observatory. To, you know, would you would you like to? And I said, heck, yeah, let's do this. So. Uh, so, yeah, that that started it right there. So I was working at the planetarium observatory since a freshman in college. And I've never looked back um, now in year 20 seven or something like that if, if you count my four college years so uh, it was uh, really if I, I think the thing that fell in love with the planetarium is is the immersiveness of the material uh, flat screens are fine for most and I guess but man when you surround yourself with the material there's nothing else like it I love it and I saw a couple of hands go up there uh, Scott will go to you first and I think I saw James go up after yeah. that yeah um I grew up in North Georgia and uh, Fermate Science Center uh, just a couple of years ago celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary. And so I was going from a very young age uh, into the Science Center and Planetarium. And uh, I'm not sure that I, I guess that had something to do with then when I got interested in rocks that I sort of was interested in space rocks. And I actually started working on uh, my first rocks when I was uh, uh, between six and seven years old and have never done nothing ever since. And um, and when, um, you know, I went off and, and, uh, did planetary geology with Arizona state and UGA back here and Brown. And, um, I was doing, uh, doing uh, a lot of academic research and, and teaching. Um, and then, uh, about six years ago, our, the, uh, geologist actually retired for the science center and, uh, my, uh, uh, good friend who, I always say masqueraded as one of uh, the astronomers at the Science Center, but was also a planetary geologist, called up and said, look, the geologist is retiring. Get yourself over here and uh, had the, you know, I sort of feel two bills. I get to the geology side and the solar system side. And then a, cu a couple of years ago or, th or three years ago now, uh, we uh, made some major upgrades to our technology in, in our huge dome and talk about immersiveness. Um, you know, everything you can do for the universe and the galaxies and the stars, obviously you can do for the solar system and then bringing that, you know, bringing the earth and, and the details of the surfaces of the planets is something we've worked on in the last couple of years. And it's just very, really fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And uh, James, we'll go to you next. I saw your hand and then Carolyn, we'll go to, go to you after that. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. So, you mentioned uh, Cosmos earlier, and I was thinking, yeah, when I was about 13, Carl Sagan and Jack Horkheimer were my two biggest influences. And I mentioned Jack Horkheimer earlier. Not only did he produce the TV show that I used to watch uh, on our local television, uh, yes, but um, keep looking up. I Thank you. Um, but he also was the- You got director. some answer tonight, James. Yeah, I saw I saw. Uh, thing on the bottom. Sorry, it distracted me. Attention deficit disorder. So anyway, <laughs> um, one of the things Jack was famous for is that he could tell a story very well. And he, one of the shows that I saw when I was about 13 years old was Child of the Universe. And that show had originally debuted in April of 1972. And it was so popular that it played at planetariums around the world. And when I saw that show, for the first time when I was 13, I went to the person behind the console and asked them, how does a person get to do what you do for a living? Because you don't meet planetarium people all the time. You know, you you know, you meet fire people and bank people and, and police officers and stuff like that. So they brought me on as an apprentice at that time. 
And just being in a planetarium, and you probably, those of you who work in a planetarium or visited one, notice it's such a unique environment for, as uh, Dan said, it's an immersive environment. And it, with all the technology we have nowadays, you really feel like you're there, like you're flying through the rings of Saturn or, you, uh, or you're on the surface of a planet and so forth. And you can even visit exoplanets. So I think having planetariums will always be kind of an escape for a lot of us. And those of us who work in planetariums who are fans of Star Trek and Star Wars, it's kind of our, our way of being able to go into space without having to go through that vomit comet and that centrifuge that NASA folks have to go through when they go into space, <laughs> or at least to train to go into space. Yeah, so. Awesome. And so that's actually something <clears throat> I was talking to Scott about. Uh, on the wall at uh, Science Center when I was there some years ago is a breakdown of <clears throat> if you're in high school and you want to get into uh, space science and you want to do certain things, it has like this roadmap for you. And I took a picture of that roadmap before I started college and it gives a breakdown of like you start here in high school, do these things in college, and then eventually you can work on um, getting into being, you know, if you want to do planetarium shows and stuff. And so I love that you mentioned that because that that was my first connection. I'm like, oh man, so you're the guy that works there. So that was that was super cool to have that connection, you know, all these years later because I love that. That really stuck in my mind when this, with the 70 some museums I've seen in the last five or six years. Uh, so Carolyn, let's go to you next. Had to unmute. Yeah, uh, James actually brings up an interesting point about the immersivity of it and also the cosmos part of it because my first experience with any kind of TV show that wasn't like Star Trek, which of course I've been a Trekkie for years, but was with Carl Sagan's cosmos and I would be glued to the set every Sunday night when those episodes were coming on. And it took me someplace and the planetarium kind of does the same thing. And the years that I was working at Fisk Planetarium, we had a lot of school students coming in and I, I would teach five or six shows a day or sometimes eight during, during um, uh, field trip season, which everybody talks about, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you, you lose your voice by the end of the sixth show. But I would put some music on and they would come into the room and it's such a different room. It smells different. It's round. It's got interesting lighting in it that nobody else has. And they would come in and they were practically dancing to the music. And then I, it would be all I could do to get them to sit down and enjoy what we're going to talk about. But it really transformed them into being very much more receptive about learning about astronomy and about science where you, you always know that some students are going to come in and they're really not interested and they they're just there because it's a field trip. But, but, you know, if you can do something in that dome that really turns them on, that's that's the thing that you want to do. And so with me, it was always music and I'm lowering the lights. And I, I uh, always know when I walked into a planetarium, if I were blind, I would know it because a planetarium has a specific smell. It has a specific sound and it's, it's a specific ambiance. And even though I don't have one now, I mean, I do have a planetarium, it's in my studio. But when I walk into somebody else's theater, if I came to James's or someplace, I'd know immediately, even, even if I had my eyes closed, that's where I am. It's a special space. And it's a place where you can use you can, you can use it to take people someplace that they haven't been before. You said you have you have your own planetarium in your studio. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but of course you're like, yeah, of course I do. I mean, that's just the answer to that question. Well, it's it's a three meter, it's a three meter dome with a digistar in it. And yeah, we uh, I've been spending this summer because there's not a lot going on right now. I've been spending the summer learning all the new Digistar stuff. So they have webinars and I, you know, log in and do that. Just taking notes here. Anybody else that wants to jump in on this one? Uh, you know, Kat? Okay, Kat, we'll go with okay. this. Yeah, so kind of bouncing off of what my um, wonderful colleagues have been saying, but to add to it, on a very personal level for me, the reason I fell in love with this work is the moment I walk in my dome, it becomes a stage and I become a magician that transports people all over the world, all over the universe. And it's not just about space. One of the great things about planetariums is they are interdisciplinary spaces. And there are a lot of us that aren't even astronomy majors at all. There are history majors that find their way into planetariums. There's artists that find their way in. So it's a very interdisciplinary space where you bring all of these disciplines together to create this magical experience. And I've been enchanted with it ever since. Love it. Let's go to you next then, Dave. Yeah, I think um, Kat, Kat said, uh, summarize some of what I was going to say, which is it is a, 
it is a very unique, immersive, creative space. It's a great teaching tool, but it's also a place where, like I said, I I first got attracted to them because of laser shows, which I consider to be an art form. And so, um, you know, when I first uh, got it, came to the planetarium, I really had no initial interest in going towards the education side of things. Um, I was heading more on a research track and I got convinced by, by, by my advisor to um, volunteer at a planetarium and it is just such a special, unique environment. And there's, it's really hard to explain. You just have to go um, be there and experience it. And you can go anywhere um, in the universe or just to wherever your imagination can take you. So um, there's art and you could do literature and history and it is very, very interdisciplinary. So it's not just space. Love it. Dave, I think you wanted to hop in there, didn't you? Yeah, I I have a different story and I find it's interesting that I got started with video games. Um, when I was a kid, I'd play a lot of video games and I kind of made my own websites and started to learn how to program computers. And I went to college and was kind of like all over the place, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, Got ended up getting a science degree, education degree. Um, when I went to get my first job, they offered me to run a planetarium and I was like, sounds pretty cool to me. And so I literally walked into the planetarium. Um, the person who was before me uh, unfortunately had passed away and I picked up this book off the shelf. And um, I started, I, I didn't even know what it was. And I, I opened it up and I, I cracked the book open and I, I couldn't stop reading. And I, immediately went out and I bought a bunch more Car uh, Carl Sagan books and I just consumed them. And it was just a passion. My name, you know, my channel now, Cosmos Safari. I, I know you Ron, have a, a place in your heart for the newer cosmos, but uh, it was like Carl Sagan was speaking to directly to me and I never felt that way about anything before. And I just got hooked. So for me, it's the community. Now it's the people. Um, you know, the, the science of it is just mind boggling. And the, the fact that when I talk about it, it, I can see the excitement on people's face is really what kind of makes me excited in life is to help people feel that what I felt when I opened up the Carl Sagan book. So if I can just bring a little bit of that to someone's life, uh, I think I've done my job. And I, and I do say this, that after I watched, like, as soon as I watched the first episode, um, I needed more. Obviously, it was a weekly show, right? So one of the first things I immediately did was I watched the entire season of, of Carl's in between the week of that first episode and the second one. So uh, Cosmo, my my copy of Cosmos actually went with me to Ever Space Camp Trek. Um, I would love to if I ever actually uh, get to meet her. Uh, Andrean is to get her to, to sign my copy plus the new one. Uh, so she's my, she's my number one person I still want to interview. Uh, she's really high on my list. So I adore Carl as well. I don't think that there's anybody that doesn't love Carl. <laughs> so I'd be shocked if I ever heard it. Uh, Mike, let's go to you, brother. Yeah, yeah. So I have, so just to echo some of the wonderful things that have been discussed already. So I had the, the honor of meeting Carl Sagan uh, when I was in middle school. Um, I had my copy of Cosmos and he came to, I grew up in Western New York outside of Buffalo. And he came to the University of Buffalo and he gave a lecture, a public lecture in a big sports arena. There were probably a few thousand people there. And after uh, the lecture was over, he, he disappeared behind the stage and I ran after him. Uh, and of course, this was, a, this was in the 80s, so there was no security. And I was able to get behind there and, and go out and there was a red carpet and it led to this limousine with tinted windows. And I thought, my God, that was my only chance. I missed him. He's there. It's over. You know, I turn around, my head down, walking back to the building, only to bump into Carl Sagan coming out. And I couldn't even speak. I think I said Dr. Sagan, or I tried to say Dr. Sagan. He knew what was going on. He took my copy of Cosmos, signed it, gave it back to me, smiled. And that was a life-changing event for me. And that's part of what we do in the planetarium. We give experiences, teachable moments that um, is the common thread of humanity. If, if I were to show you a silhouette of two humans on a horizon looking up at the sky, could you tell me what year that was? It's the, something that every human has seen. And with light pollution, 
we tend to not see the majestic Milky Way these days. So that's part of the experiences that we, we, we build, those teachable moments that can then build upon and to get the next Carl Sagan. That was that was wonderful. And uh, so something I want to touch on real quick, too, is that um, some comments that, that can't be seen here on uh, Twitch and on my personal Facebook. And uh, one person is Abigail Bolenbach, and she uh, was recently on a panel with you, Carolyn. But Dan, in particular, she worked with you on her on her show. So she was uh, she was saying that you were incredible to work with. I know you said that you worked with students. So 17, she wrote her own show, had it there. And uh, so that that was a really big moment for her. So, Dan, you mentioned that you work with students um, to do this. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about like how that works. And then if there's anybody else here that works with students, other homeschooled and, and how that works, I'd love to talk about that. But, Dan, I'll go to you first. Well, hello, Abigail. Wow. Uh didn't think of that. Uh, great to hear Abigail Bolenbach's name. Uh, yes. Uh, so how, how it works here basically is uh, our, we have a very large school. So Jenks Public Schools, uh, the high school, the graduating class is roughly a thousand, just, just under. Um, and so it's basically a mini campus here at high school because you got 4,000 people in pretty much one little campus here. And so with that large number, it does allow me to treat it like a university would and we have very and, and due to the large pool of students there's a lot of talent and so uh this started when i was uh back in a planetarium in philadelphia uh the north penn uh, and i just brought it over here to jenks but basically this is a bigger school so i could say okay theater department i need actors for voiceovers and they come and audition and i find right voices that go together uh like for abby's show that she uh wrote for this uh, the saturn show she wrote i needed to get a male counterpart for her and so went to the theater department. Uh, if I need music, I uh, just you know contact the music teacher, say, hey, do you have any students that can compose music? And they uh, they start putting stuff together, and uh, we work through uh, we just work through the moods I need and the rhythms I need. I need to make sure that the kids know that's background music, not yeah. I don't I don't want the attention drawn from them, which is good for the students because especially the composers because usually kids like to do this what they like. And they need to learn, you need to do what the client likes. And so they get real, real hands on uh, experience with that. Same with my artists that usually our logos are made by students, logos for the show or, or, or supplement art. And again, it's to my liking. So they might draw something that they think is fantastic. But again, you got to please the clients. Uh, so we do that. Uh, so I say, I talk about the acting. Uh, we usually get some sort of programmer or animator. Uh, they, that comes from our, uh, you know, film department. And, uh, the only thing right now that I would like to have the students do more of is the script writing. Uh, that takes a little harder because the script writing that you usually have to do a year ahead. So I would have to have this year's students working on next year's script. And that so far is the hardest to get going regularly. Uh, but like I said, Abigail, she took her beautiful talk on Saturn and, and the Cassini satellite and we turned that into a planetarium show and it was a fantastic work with Abigail. Uh, but that's basically what we do. We just work with the different departments in the school and bring them together, which is what I love what uh, I think it was Kat that said, we're not just astronomy. We can teach so much more with history or, or like I'm doing with my students, I can teach them about com composition for multimedia planetariums. I can teach them about art, making art for a company and stuff like that. So that's, yeah, that's sort of what Jinx Planetarium does uh, every year, a couple times a year. Love it. Yeah, so Abigail was on my birthday show about, uh, like right around a month ago, uh, we had Neil deGrasse Tyson and a few other people. So I had to kind of nudge her in the direction to tell him about the show. So maybe we can twist his arm someday, see if we can get it at Hayden Planetarium. So uh, hopefully oh. we can, yeah, maybe we can do that one day. Like he, I'm, I'm not sure that he would do it, but he was really excited about hearing about her excitement for it. And I love that it doesn't matter the level you are on as a science communicator. You can be world famous. Carl Sagan was just like Mike said. He ran into him, and Carl's like, uh, "I got that." And you know, right to the him and hand it back to him, right? Like Carl is billions and billions, know, billions and billions. <laughs> that's here. That's home. That's us. Uh, so you know, we all love that. And uh, Carolyn, let's go to you next and talk a little bit about uh, what you've done with the, the students. Well, when I was at Fisk. I, we did a couple of shows and it was up to me to really teach the students about the script writing and the programming and the, the pacing of a show because the pacing is really important. Back when I was doing that in the beginning, we didn't have the video predict, 
projection systems like we do have now. So we had to time it around how quickly slide projectors would go around and how quickly the Zeiss, because we worked with a big Zeiss machine, how you could bring that up and how it would turn. Today, we, you know, we work in a much more video, well, we work in a video environment and you can go as fast or as slow as you want, but you're still in an immersive space. And so your, your students need to learn. And I'm sure that, that Dan has probably, you know, found this out that things can only move so fast. One of the things I wanted to bring up was there's a festival, there's a whole movement the people that want to use the dome for all kinds of presentations, as Kat has brought up, it's art, it's history, it's it's animation, it's it's all kinds of things. It is beyond astronomy, and it starts with astronomy, and that's important, and it moves on to other topics. And there's a series of festivals that I've gone to in Europe called the Yena Full Dome Film Festivals. And every year that I've gone, there have been students there from the Bauhaus who have learned how to who have learned how to design for the dome. And they may not be doing astronomy; it might be some other topic, but they come up with the most creative uses for the dome that I think I've ever seen. So in addition to it being an inspirational place for astronomy, it's also this place where you can sort of let your mind roam artistically, historically, in other sciences, in music and art to, to create a space that you can immerse yourself in. And I think that's a really important thing to bring up with students as well. You can just let your mind roll. And it may be about astronomy and you're going to the sun or you're going to the planets, but you can find new ways to do it now. And then you're, you're, you know, your imagination is really your only limit. Love it, love it, love it. And uh, so anybody else that wants to jump in on that, that works with kids? Uh, okay, well, we'll go with Mike, then James, then Dave and Liz, because I think Dave actually wanted to go earlier and I missed him. So Mike, we'll go with you first, brother. Sure, so, so we, uh, so when, just to echo what was just said, when it, when I was pitching the planetarium to the, to the joint board of the museum and the university, I kept getting asked, you know, what can we do? What can we show? What can we, what can we put on the planetarium? And the answer I came up with is anything you want. It's like you're looking at a blank, three-dimensional immersive canvas and asking, what can you do? So yeah, astronomy is the gateway that you bring people in. It's a gateway science, but you can do so many other things, um, including archaeoastronomy, where you bring in culture. One of the one of the things we do with the side dome is we have interns, and we're having interns look at the archaeoastronomical significance of lunar alignment in the Hopewell Culture Newark Earthworks, where we, where we are in Newark, Ohio. And of course, we can just put a panorama of the sky and we can go back 100,000 years and forward 100,000 years and we can test this. This is low hanging fruit that you can actually do research with. And in addition to other, other disciplines, I've been working on a physics curriculum that you can put uh, on the planetarium as well. So this is something that uh, anyone could benefit from. And, and as Dan was saying, the wonderful work that he does with students, we try to continue at the, uh, at the Works Museum. Fantastic. James, we'll go to you next, then uh, we'll go over to you, uh, Dave. <laughs> okay, so my experience with uh, students, uh, one of them was quite interesting. We have a professor at our college who teaches African drumming, and we're always looking for unique opportunities for our public to experience the planetarium in new ways. So uh, Professor Larson and I thought, you know, if we could have your students perform a concert in the planetarium, uh, that would be a very unique experience because our, our planetarium has unique acoustics. As you probably all know, that just the shape of the ceiling uh, allows the sound to reverberate in a unique way. So as part of his students' final exam, we had them have a concert in the planetarium to for general public. And it was an amazing experience to, to not only see the students, there were probably about maybe 10 students in the class and they were all playing in harmony and the teacher, of course, he was leading them and they would do various uh, uh, rhythms and songs from different parts of Africa. And it was a- uh, Sounds it, awesome. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. Um, even though we didn't, um, we did do some lighting effects and we brought the lights down and showed the stars from, uh, from Central Africa uh, and, and, you know, with the latitude and all that. It was cool to be able to see the Southern Cross go across the dome. Yeah. But it's, um, it was, it's nice to use the planetarium for things other than strictly space stuff. And uh, so, I mean, so last year around this time was, uh, I was in Africa uh, climbing Kilimanjaro. Um, and 
seeing that well one you're not going to get you're not going to get better views of the night sky being on a mountain like nepal uh you know uh kilimanjaro all that those areas are beautiful there's no lights forever and there's hardly anybody else around you and it's cool to kind of, because one of the one of the uh, people that was climbing with me uh sarah silva uh kind of did like a uh a mini um um uh uh dave you're one of them i'm blanking on the name of it right now too uh Solar System Ambassador. She did kind of like a mini one for the rest of us that were doing the trek and showed us the night sky because she'd already been to the Southern Hemisphere a few times. So we were all taking pictures and it was a really, really cool thing to be able to see that. But to experience the night sky like that, seeing it for the first time, that area in such dark skies was just incredible. Uh, but man, I love that story. Uh, Liz, I'll go to you next and then you, Dave. Um, I skipped her. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> so, fine. Um, so the only way I've worked with students so far is uh, we do astronomy summer camps and um, we decided to experiment with uh, having like a heavy planetarium component to our middle school summer camp one year where um, one of their main activities was over the course of five days to come up with a five minute planetarium show and they would use our digital sky system to at the end of the week um, present to their friends and family and we made that kind of freely open to the public as well so that was a big challenge because they had other things they were doing during camp as well but it was amazing what some of these kids came up with especially in the course of five days where we had to just introduce them to the system and its capabilities and show them examples and um and then just say, what does this inspire in you? And then they had to do research and write a little script and they worked in groups and then we had to have rehearsals and somehow we got that all done. And at the end of the fifth day, um, they, we had a half hour show where every group got their five, six minutes of fame and presented their own little planetarium show. And that was one, that was one of the neatest experiences and just seeing what some of these kids came up with and, and what, what the medium inspired in them so that's amazing uh dave will go to you next and then scott if you want to jump in afterwards we'll uh, we'll definitely ping you too because i mean obviously you're in the parking lot with a school so <laughs> dave will go to you sir hit us man so i've been working with students for a number of years and my main thing is that i want the students to run the facility from start to finish i don't want to be uh the planetarium director at all i'm more I like to think of myself more as a facilitator. Um, when it comes to the public shows, I don't present to the public at all. Um, I do present to our high, or to our students in the high school. I do produce uh, shows for our elementary students. But when it comes to the general public, I try to take a step back and let the kids uh, from my high school astronomy club be the ones to run the, our facility, which. Um, and I even tell them while we're while we're working with it that I want them to learn it for themselves and teach each other. And I'm kind of just there as uh, I tell them I'm just a beating heart. You know, I, I really do want to be there, though, just kind of helping them get to that next step. But I want them to explore the system because I'm not as good as some of the students coming in um, at the programming. It's amazing if you kind of just step back what they can do. So that's the that's the role I feel like I've taken. I love it, uh, Dave. We're gonna. I'm sorry, uh, Scott. We're gonna go to you next, and then Carolyn will go to you because I know you have another story to share. Uh, so Scott, tell us a little bit about what you do there. So when I first pulled in, I thought I was in the wrong place. At the time, I was traveling all over the country, and I pulled in, and I'm like, "This is a school." And then, like, I noticed where I had to go. So I like the mixture. That's really awesome. Well, we do have an elementary school across the street from us, but we are part of the school system. We actually are uh, owned and operated by the DeKalb County School District, one of the largest and most diverse uh, school districts in, in the country. And, um, and so we have a, a student body technically uh, just with our county. We serve, we serve a much broader audience, but just with our county, something around 150,000 or so students. And uh, obviously we don't see all of those inside the planetarium. We take a lot of content with our, our entire science staff and, and K-12 staff, staff out with outreach programs, but we do have a huge number of people. We have 500 seat planetarium. We have enormous number of people and, you know, we can't get wait to get this pandemic over with so we can get back to that. Um, but we also, um, we've, we've been looking at being able to, to find the, the time and the place to really 
to to have that more engagement with the students on building shows and that sort of thing. Um, some of our new video technology, I think, will allow that. But we, uh, I, I feel sort of obligated to say one of the special things we do is uh, we have a, uh, a, a program called Scientific Tools and Techniques that uh, where uh, there it's like a magnet program with 90 ninth graders that uh, each semester that come to our facility and go through 16 disciplines. And um, I was uh, a few years ago when some of our curricula changed, uh, we combined astronomy and, and geology and, and I created a, a planetary science course. And uh, the planetarium is an integral part of that, as well as I created a, a, a whole hour and a half uh, experience, as we call them, in the planetarium where we bring uh, middle school students in, typically sixth graders for our uh, standards. And uh, I can have a packed house of, of, you know, don't tell the fire marshal, but 500 plus. And uh, we, we use the whole multimedia experience. We have a full dome show. We have uh, uh, cameras broadcasting demonstrations up onto the dome. There's a lecture component. And then one of the things I use with both of those environments that just turned out to work naturally uh, Google Earth projects without any kind of special warping or anything on our dome. And I can literally sit down and take a trip. Uh, if I want to teach stratigraphy to my STT class, I can take a trip through the Grand Canyon walking around. If I want to go, if I'm, if I'm talking about impacts, I can go go to Media Crater and sit down and walk around. And, and that's been, you know, wonderful. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, stop talking for now, but uh, kind of if we can get back in a minute to some, some of the, what others have touched on with those unique things that we can do outside of the students. No, that's, that's a great one to go to here in a few minutes. Carolyn, we'll go to you. And then uh, I've actually got a question for everybody working in a, working in museums uh, and planetarium now that I want to go to. And then I'd love to talk about those unique ways that you can, we can utilize these. Carolyn, you, you next. Well, back when I was working at the university, one of my jobs was to also train our student presenters. And those of you who have students, you know that a lot of times they'll come in and they're not, some of them are afraid to talk to the public or they've never done this before. And so what I would do is we'd run them through a little kind of an academy of, okay, you can give a star talk once you've shown me that you can give a star talk. And so they would go into the theater and practice and I would give them practice time. And I would never tell them if I was going to come and stand in the back, I could go stand in the gallery in the back. And I would go in and listen to them. And if they were really good and, you know, we coached them and we obviously would practice with them and they had a standard star talk they had to give, but they learned how to talk to the public. Well, one of the guys that I had was one of the most shy people I'd ever had. His name was Nathan. And he was so scared. He could barely get up in front of the, uh, you know, just barely stand in the console to give a talk. We worked with him and we worked with him and we worked with him. And he was finally one of our best presenters. And at the end of his career at the university, he went on to do graduate work. And he was one of the people that I ran into when I was out covering a Mars mission at JPL. He was the guy that was in charge of naming the rocks that one of the missions was finding. And he was able to stand up there in front of, you know, the worldwide audience and go, okay, we're calling this rock this and we're calling this rock that. And I was so proud of him to see that he could actually get up there and talk to the world about astronomy and remembering back when he was just this little skinny, scared freshman and he had just grown so much. I was really proud of that. That was one of my really cool experiences with the kids. Uh, one, that's an amazing story. And I'm sure everyone here has like, it has one of those as well. Um, and I, I definitely want to go into that. Some of your best experiences, because we, we certainly have that at uh, the Discovery Center too. Some people that I've seen that have come in that uh, have had issues with um, um, being in social situations that have become some of our best volunteers, give some of our best tours. It really is a wonderful place what a, mu what a museum can do for somebody and, and let them find their place. I mean, it happened with me. Uh, you know, I came in, fell in love with it and ended up doing something like 100 hours of volunteering in the first week and a half, two weeks that I was there. Well, I think it was like three weeks. It might have been a little more towards like three, three and a half weeks. But I was just there all the time. I'm like, I want to be here as much as humanly possible. This is great. Uh, but my question for some of you is th those of you that are currently um, still in planetariums, you're running planetariums. COVID has kind of changed a lot of things for a lot of people. And uh, so there's a lot of people out there that have got kids right now. Maybe they're not feeling too comfortable about coming back into museums, planetariums, observatories. So I want to touch on a little bit of what you're doing now for like safety precautions, ideas that you've had, and things that are bringing people back in um, to the experiences that you create. So I'll let anybody go, go first that's, that's still in one if you want to share some stuff that you're doing. Um, so uh, Scott, we'll go with you first. Well, 
Ours is simple from a safety standpoint because in, in large measure, because we are part of a large school district uh, in metropolitan Atlanta, uh, we're simply not open and we don't have uh, any definitive plans for when we will be open. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, the challenges that I have really uh, uh, kind of appreciated um, being able to try to remedy uh, in terms of just continuing to have engagement with our planetarium and our entire science center. And uh, for four months now, I have uh, lived on, uh, on uh, uh, Zoom and Facebook Live and just continue to, to, put, to put out programming thanks to a lot of the, the, the planetarium um, content uh, providers that have uh, offered up some flat screen versions and all. But we've also produced our own things across a, across a multidisciplinary uh, spectrum. And really, uh, one of the things that's been great that we don't normally get to do in the, when we're in the dome is bringing in uh, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we can show content and bring in more of my colleagues that are experts on that particular subject and spend time with them. And it's it's been an incredible thing where we have really uh, expanded our, uh, those who know about us and our audience and what we do uh, from regionally to nationally. And it is, it's actually been kind of exciting and we're gonna keep doing that even when we, uh, and I've heard this from a lot of colleagues uh, with other science centers and planetaria around the world. Um, we're going to keep doing all this once we are back to quote normal. That's great to hear. And uh, you know, that's something that I was really brought on for us to start doing more digital virtual things because I had the background in it. So when everything happened for us, like we had to become the digital space foundation, our education programs, our uh, science on a sphere, our DTUs, the discover the universe, all that stuff had to go digital. And we all, um, a lot of us, a great deal of us already had a bit of a background in that. So those virtual programs have really, really been um, exciting. So uh, James, I see that you'd like to go next. We'll go to you and then uh, whoever else would like to follow cat. I think I already see you typing so i'll go to you <laughs> okay yeah so yeah so unfortunately our planetarium isn't open yet however during the last yeah, i guess five months since we've uh the college has been closed or at least the planetarium itself is closed um i've been able to use the use youtube as a, a way to continue to get astronomy out there now we were um the the astronomy series that i started um the sky above us. We started it back in February. Our first episode was March of the Planets because during the month of March, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were all in a nice conjunction as Mars was passing by them. Seems like ages ago, <laughs> but um, I was able to take current con content and put it on YouTube and share it with um, more people that could fit in my planetarium, interestingly enough. Um, and once they had to close the studio that I recorded in, my, uh, my uh, video guy was able to make an animation of me. So I would record the audio here at home, and then I would send the audio, and I would send my screen captures of what Stellarium would look like and other uh, B-roll and stuff that he could put in there. And we would put the episodes together uh, remotely. And now I finally am back in the studio again. So now I can stand in front of my green screen and, and talk about um, what's going on in the sky. And I was able to do that pretty much on the fly uh, when we had Comet Neowise come through. With, uh, the, with Stargazers, we usually record those episodes two months in advance. So if there was a comet that came by that was going to be particularly bright, you really couldn't talk much about what it was going to look like because by the time it came by, the episode we recorded was already in the can and ready to go. So I made the decision probably about a week after it uh, reached perihelion and everyone was taking pictures. I was like, hey, let me go make my next episode Comet Neo-wise. So I did that, put it on there, and even uh, Dave, he went out and did photography of Comet Neo-wise for Cosmos Safari. And that was really awesome to watch him do that because – to see, because I hadn't gone to do any astrophotography of the comet yet, because from us living so far south, Comet Neo was still cl too close to the horizon for us to see in the morning. So I had to wait until it was in the evening sky. But um, when Dave did that, it um, he kind of showed the human side of making, uh, doing an astrophotography event and what it was like to go out into the field. I hope I'm not stealing what you're going to talk about, <laughs> Dave. But um it was uh, it was inspiring to me. So it was nice to be able to give um, the people who followed me on Stargazers uh, a way to continue to 
to follow what we were doing. And I'm now doing a podcast. So I'm going to contact Dean Regas from Cincinnati to see if he'd like to be a guest, uh, a guest, uh, I guess, visitor, host, or, or something that he'll be a guest speaker. That's what it is. Or just plain old guest on the uh, on our <laughs> podcast. So that's that's wonderful and it's it's great to see people doing that again it's i think that that has to that had to be and has to be the focus but i'm also really thrilled that everybody wants to continue this afterwards now that everybody realizes the value of it so uh cat we'll go to you next yeah so like many of my colleagues um i do remain closed though there is a light at the end of the tunnel our museum was able to open a couple of weeks ago so we're hoping sometime in october we might get to open but the planetarian community has not been idle. Uh, it was really amazing and fascinating, especially from my research perspective, to see all of my colleagues mobilize over the spring and summer and switch gears. So now, you know, we're out of our domes, but how can we immerse people and engage people outside of our domes? And on a personal level, I had focused so much energy into live presentations and performances and I didn't have a, a great wealth of video skills but I've developed those over this year and when we do open the planetarium I'll be able to now enhance the work that I do under my dome because I have built these video um, building skills this year so I'm really excited to to kind of bring the two worlds together uh, after all of this passes wonderful Bye. wonderful stuff Dan we'll go to you next yeah, the, the, this pandemic pretty much, the, the word is adapt. Uh, we've had to adapt. Now, Oklahoma, uh, we are finally open. Schools are uh, schools are open I, with adjustments, of course, social distancing, desks are further apart. Uh, the planetarium is open for the public shows, but it's minimum. It's small groups only. I think we're under, I mean, we seat 120 in the planetarium, but we can only have 25 come in total. Uh, cause we have to spread them out. So, so we are open and we're back up and running, but it, it, it is, it's about adapting. And the cool thing is, 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 as I went to YouTube for most of my, I started making YouTube shows and lessons for our kids before school opened up. But by having to do that through the pandemic, we realized I need to be doing this anyway, because it's a good tool for the students, a good tool for the public. So the fact the fact that we're now open up is great with limitations, but the fact that we've now learned that we can do this mobily is just open up so many more doors. Wonderful. Liz, we'll go to you next. Uh, I'm mute there. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I am uh, one of the few people, I guess, who is open. We opened back in at the beginning of June and um, we put a bunch of safety precautions in place. So we have, um, my theater is 55 feet, 145 seats. And so we limited capacity to uh, 45 tops. And um, we just came out with, uh, came up with a plan on how to seat people and a plan for um, just ushering people to their seats. So we ensure that they stay at least six feet apart, get, get nice and spaced out uh, in the theater. And uh, we do require the uh, wearing of masks um, during the show at all times and um, trying to keep uh, live shows, uh, you know, uh, kind of on the short side. Um, and uh, they've been, um, they've been going okay. And, uh, the attendance has been kind of minimal, um, but we did have a couple of uh, laser nights, um, which was uh, kind of a special event thing where we did max out at 45, but we got everybody spaced out and everybody cooperated and everybody seemed really grateful that we were taking precautions to uh, try to keep everybody safe. And so that's kind of how it's been so far. And we continue to have a virtual presence um, while we were shut down for a few months. Um, I just just doing doing some virtual sky tours online just to, you know, kind of keep in touch with the community. And uh, now I continue to do those just to say, um, keep in touch and and just to let everybody know that we are open and that we're trying to keep everybody safe and encourage people to Wonderful. come back. As Dr. David Tico, so. hit us, man. 
Yeah, uh, so, yeah. So just to echo some of the wonderful things I've been saying here, uh, you know, being forced to have to get better at our video and our online um, repertoire is, is something that's going to pay dividends even after we recover from the COVID crisis. And part of what we're looking into, I teach an astronomy cosmology course in the dome for gen ed students. Um, and, you know, that's a wonderful experience, but I had to somehow morph that into a two dimensional version and we do it on Zoom now. And it's actually, I'd rather be in the dome, but it's not so bad. We can, we can bring in different resources. So we're building our library of videos as my other colleagues have said. And we're exploring actually looking at, uh, you know, um, VR and, and AR um, tran transitions from what you would see in the dome to what you can see at home with, you know, Oculus or Google Cardboard. So there are things, not, not that I would ever not want people to go to a planetarium, but there are opportunities that we can, you know, take lemons and make lemonade. And uh, one last thought is um, we're exploring other activities that we can do since we are also closed, like my other colleagues, we're opening hopefully in, in October. Uh, but we're looking at things like library lending programs for telescopes. So people can go and, and uh, check out telescopes and have kind of virtual and remote star parties. Um, so it's, it's the same idea, but it's just a broader reach and it's forcing us to be better. Great, Dave, we'll go to you, sir. So uh, like some of the other folks, I'm still closed down. I uh, am in a school, that, so we really can't, um, even though we have students in the classrooms, we're not going to be doing any unnecessary busing and things like that. So um, it just so happens that I had already started a YouTube channel personally um, with Cosmos Safari. And uh, so I've been working on videos for that, and I've been trying to do things um, through my Cosmos Safari channel. And recently, once again, I'm on Twitch on Wednesday nights doing planetarium shows. So uh, I'm trying to get it out of my system, basically, because uh, I enjoy the process and I enjoy talking about this kind of stuff. Um, but for our planetarium shows, um, for our students, we're going to be basically making videos um, that will meet the needs and meet the standards that we had been trying to address already in the dome. So uh, I'm actually very thankful that I had already started all the YouTube stuff about a year before the pandemic hit. And so I kind of feel like I have a head start on all of this, but um, I'm encouraged to hear a lot of people are interested in getting into it. I know James, for example, um, you know, he and I had been friends for many years already and I had kind of uh, encouraged him to to do some of this stuff, and I'm so excited that he is. So, uh, the more people we get involved, I don't think there is a critical mass. Um, we're just going to keep growing the audience, and I think that more people are going to be interested in space, and that's a good thing. I love it. Anybody else want to touch on anything before we go to the next uh, the next question? Just don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, so we've got a, um, a great one here. Let me find it real quick. And uh, it's actually a question that I'm interested in because I would like to see more of this. Um, and Snyder Smith asks, it's a question for the group. How is VR, AR being incorporated into planetariums, if it is, and either at the planetarium or in outreach programs? Uh, so is there anybody that wants to touch on that or is anybody using it all? Okay, I'll go from top and we'll go from there. Kat, we'll start with you. All right, so um, I actually, I love this question because um, as a researcher, I started almost immediately exploring uh, how to translate the planetarium experience into a VR experience. And planetariums really are the, one of the most original VR systems we have um, in reality. So it, it's very prototype right now, but I've been going on, uh, to alt vr through the 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 oculus goes um, and trying to explore that and and i'm getting into world building and things like that and in a lot of ways it can actually be more immersive than our planetariums can be because you can then start to interact with the environment whether rather than just being inside of it um, as a passive observer you can start to interact with it I would love to see down the line when this pandemic passes where you can actually combine the two, where you can have these large group experiences in the planetarium and then bring them more on a small scale with uh, VR environments. Um, and for us at our site, uh, we haven't, again, it's still a prototype, but we're hoping 
to actually be able to loan VR headsets to classrooms. Uh, so we have like a small fleet of them and eventually we would like to create content specifically uh, towards our museum and planetarium mission that we can share with the classrooms uh, in a safer way. Because unfortunately schools, large schools especially, will not be coming to us for quite some time. So how do we keep that, con that connection and how do we still give our students those immersive uh, experiential experiences. Love it. And I saw so many hands. I don't know who went first. So uh, anybody that wants to jump, Carolyn, we'll go to you next. Well, well, and what Kat said is absolutely right. And there are, there's a lot of strain of discussion now about whether or not you want to make the planetarium show, which is sort of a group experience into this sort of individual experience with the AR or with the VR headset. With our shows, we did turn them into VR experiences. We have a little VR theater that people can come and get the shows. The thing that has fascinated me was exactly what you would do if you wanted to institute an AR experience so that you're, you're augmenting what you're already doing in the dome. And how do you do that? What's the technology? How's it going to work? And how do you make it so that it's still that kind of group experience that we enjoy in the dome, but also something that you're augmenting and maybe somebody, you can maybe personalize that experience for each attendee. And I'm still kind of reading about that. It's, it's as Kat said, it's still sort of in progress at this point. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Liz, we'll go to you next. Um, okay, well, I, I guess we haven't used VR or AR in the dome, but um, going back to what Kat had mentioned earlier about um, during the lockdown, kind of expanding um, our skill set and, and, and looking for different creative things to do, one of the things that I got to do uh, while we were shut down was um, work with a fellow named Bentley Oosley from uh, Kansas City on uh, creating a, our first 360 VR sky tour, which was really exciting. And so that's something I never would have had time to do had uh, had the lockdown not happened. So I learned a lot there and, and hopefully we'll be able to make some more of those um, and be able to uh, reach reach the public that way as well. So not in, not in the dome, but uh, using VR. Anybody else wants to jump in on that or any, any plans to do that? Dave. So I kind of uh, was thinking about this many years ago, um, but I, I'm just kind of a Trekkie, you know, I'm wearing a Star Trek <laughs> shirt right now. If you remember from one of the more recent uh, Trek movies, Spock is back on Vulcan and he is in this immersive learning environment where the computer is like teaching him and he's kind of answering questions really quickly. And I imagine that 20 years from now, the planetarium is going to be something that is more important for our everyday learning than we might imagine. And I think that people who are currently doing it, like as uh, our jobs, uh, we're going to be extremely valuable in that new world where, you know, these students have these immersive VR experiences, these AR experiences that um, we're kind of the forefront of that. And we've been doing this for years. So I kind of always imagine myself as an educator, like how can we be a resource for people as we move towards these, you know, personalized learning experiences for students. So uh, I know it's kind of far out there, but I really don't think it's as far off as we think. I love it. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Scott, we'll go to you. Yeah, I was just going to. Yeah, I was just going to comment. I mean, we're an example of of where we've tried some things with uh, even some with the uh, the VR and and 3D projection and things. But we're an example of you can be too big. Um, you know, our our audiences, even when we're have bringing in schools, typically are just it, it's it's too too much to to try to provide all the glasses and all the headsets and all of that all of that. That you have to have the one place that that is more attractive and that we do uh, work on and I think we'll work more toward uh, is with our portable planetariums um, that are more you know 18 20 foot foot type um, uh, inflatables and uh, so that's something I've been, Love it, been Mike, trying to I work I saw on you next sir you are you are muted Mike I am muted you you're good Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so there are some free apps from NASA uh, for AR where you can download them from uh, the Google Play Store and, uh, you know, put the Voyager satellite uh, in your room 
or a bunch of other different satellites. It's free, it's fun to do. And uh, I, I introduce it to my cosmology students. Um, something more like that can be done. There's fancier things you have to pay for, uh, but uh, there are some free AR things that you can really bring home um, to the satellites. Excellent. At least. Anybody else want to jump in on that before we go to the next one? All right, all right. So um, I want to talk a little bit. Normally in the second hour, we kind of de- uh, dive a little bit deeper into like the meaning of what all this is and, and what we do with these cool things. So Carolyn shared a little bit about some cool stories she had. So I would love to, to talk with each of you about like the most incredible experience you've ever had with somebody in during a show afterwards um you know just maybe a connection that you made you've become a mentor to them anything like that and how how important and um impactful this this job can be that you do so uh anybody wants to go first throw up a hand scott we'll go with you well like i i was talking about before of of just those incredible ways that we can use our space um let me get just a quick list here of, of sort of maybe the top three um, for the Apollo uh, 50th anniversary, um, we uh, kept kind of wondering what we were going to do. And then things sort of came together uh, over the, the last few months before the anniversary where we uh, were able to uh, actually you know, use our dome as two giant screens. And we actually uh, cross projected the uh, Apollo 11 big documentary that was had been put out that summer. And uh, we were able to incorporate that into a fantastic day that also included uh, having with us um, uh, Captain Ed Dwight, uh, who, if you don't know who that is, he was the uh, first African-American select handpicked by President Kennedy to be the first uh, African-American astronaut uh, candidate. And uh, he, he was there along with a person who's in our community, who is uh, Ron McNair's brother. <laughs> And they came in and it just, we had the place jam packed. And so that was uh, just an incredible experience getting to, uh, to talk with him about his experiences and, and, and that whole era, uh, particularly from the, the standpoint of, uh, of being a, a black man uh, c- coming, you know, there in as part of the astronaut program and just the challenges that he faced. And, and uh, it was, it was really, really special. And, um, and then on the you know complete opposite end of the spectrum, um, you know some of the things that uh, just incredible experiences for myself personally and, and our audiences and community are some of the the music um, uh, type events we've had. Uh, I actually we had a jazz singer come in and we put the jazz we worked to get the uh, the music and and her singing together with a full dome presentation of all the graphics, and uh, I actually got to literally. Uh, improv using the the spit side dome system to improv so i actually became a member of a three-person jazz band and literally played the planetarium and it, it was wild and uh, we've even had a, a rap artist come in and do do something very similar so it's just a, it's an incredible space that's amazing um mike i think i saw you next yeah so three three yeah, examples, three, three uh, examples. Uh, one that took place outside the planetarium during the the latest great american eclipse we were outside with the H Alpha telescope looking at the sun, and there was a young lady that didn't have solar glasses, and uh, I really wanted her to not miss this opportunity. So I took off my solar glasses and I gave it to her, and she looked up, and I just had the presence of mind to take a photo of her with my cell phone. The smile she had on her face um, would would win proposals for outreach. I mean, it was just an incredible thing. So again. Pr- making those teachable moments, she'll remember that the rest of her life. And this is something that we can do both inside the planetarium and outside the planetarium. Inside the planetarium, one of the one of the best reactions I get is when I show the uh, resolution of the Hubble deep field, where you look at the extreme deep field, you have 10,000 galaxies, every smudge is a galaxy, there's 100 billion, gal- 100 billion stars per galaxy. Then you ask the audience how much sky this is. And then you're able to do a zoom zoom in and a zoom out and show them that it's equivalent to a grain of sand being held up at arm's length. So these, these are the things, the immersive things that you really can't get to dimensionally that you really get in the, in the planetarium. And the, and the third thing I wanted to address is really the larger driving point for me for interacting with the public and having the general education course. And that's teaching what science is. And, and the fact that it's a verb, it's a process. 
It's a gateway to critical reasoning. So even if they don't become scientists one day, they can still use that in their life to make informed decisions. And if anyone thinks that that is not valuable in today's world, then, um, you know, maybe they should think again. Mic drop. I, I mean, don't drop a microphone. Uh, as a former DJ, that's what I ask you never to do. Never, ever drop it. But, uh, Kat, I think we're going to go to you next. Yeah, so I have a couple of experiences. I actually have so many, and that's really a testament to how wonderful this field is. But just as a couple, um, one, I wasn't even the manager yet, but it was 2017. We were about two hours from the band of totality for the Great American Eclipse. And a big shout out to Dan. We actually played one of his productions from Jake's um, Planetarium. But just seeing the amount of people, I mean, we're talking thousands that summer that came to our dome searching for information, searching for glasses. We had solar telescope viewing days. Um, whenever the weather was right. Sometimes it was the first time a person had ever been able to safely look at the star in the center of our solar system. And just to see their face light up was amazing. And I realized in that moment, again, I wasn't even the manager yet. I just realized the value and the community service that I was involved in. And on a more general level, um, and this is not really into education at all, but to kind of tie in um, with Fernbank, we do laser shows uh, all the time at my planetarium. And I do live lighting for our laser shows with my cove lights. And it's the only time in my entire life I've ever achieved a sense of flow. You hear about that, that flow that happens when somebody's doing something that it's just so wonderful and you're like in a Zen like state. And I get that every time I do a laser show. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing experience that I actually get to do as a job, which makes it a hundred million times better. I love it. Carolyn, we're going to go to you next. I already see you smiling. <laughs> oh, no, Kat just reminded me whenever I'm working out or if I'm dancing or something, and if I'm right with the music, you get that sense of flow as well. It's pretty cool. Um, so I, I'm a producer of shows, and so I don't always get to interact with with audiences anymore. So what'll happen is I'll you know I'll put a show out there. We've worked on it with whoever we've worked on it with, and we'll go out there. And what'll happen is if it's a really good show and people really enjoy it and they've run it a lot, the first time I go to a conference and people will, I'll walk in and almost always somebody will quote a line from a show at me. These are planetarium people that do this. So we had a, a show that we did about a cat who goes to space. And people will walk up and quote lines to us from, from this. And it's just always really, um, it's, it's just really touching when they do that because we don't get the feedback from the audience, but we get it back from the, from the planetarium people. They're, they're sort of our, our clients. Um, and also if we're working with other people to help create the shows, like sometimes we'll get, we'll have some budget to get a celebrity narrator and talk to them about what it's like to be in the dome. And, and fortunately, most of them we've worked with have been in domes, so they understand it. But the ones who get it really do a good job with it. And, and that always makes it really worthwhile. And that's what touches people because what we're really doing here is touching the audience. We're not just teaching them something. We're touching them emotionally. We're touching them in some way that, that you know, stirs up something in their soul about what they want to know about the, about the, the universe. And then the third thing I wanted to talk about was a little experience I had when I was teaching at Fisk. And we had a little kid's show. So we don't normally, we didn't normally let little guys in. Oh, you said Tom Hanks. We actually used Patrick Stewart too, which was like, I never wanted to wash my hands after I shook his hand. Anyway, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> no, no, it was great. It was great. But anyway, so I had these group of little kids in there. They're all about two and three years old. And we would have a five day sort of a daycare thing with them. Their mothers would drop them off for an hour and we'd teach them about space and we'd get them used to walking in the dome because you guys who teach, you know, if you bring really little guys in the dome, they get scared to death when you bring the lights down. So we would bring these little guys in three, four years old, and they would spend the week building their own rocket. And then we would take them into the dome each day to practice a launch. And then the last day we had them launch and they were going to go to the moon. And that was the day that their mom would come in or their dad and, and sit with them and watch them go through this launch. And they'd get out and they'd walk around and look at the moon. And we had a panorama, panorama up of the moon. Well, one of these classes, we had one little kid who was really problematic. He just missed his mom every day. We finally talked him into getting up there on the stage and we launched him up there. And it was the last day and all the moms are sitting there and the, and the dads and they're sitting there in the front row. 
and we landed on the moon and this little guy puts his head out the door and goes, mom, are you on the moon with me? And the place just died. I mean, it was just, it was just perfect. perfect. Oh. And we all just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And, and then we brought him back and, and mama was practically crying, you know, because she was so touched by the whole thing. She told us later it was the first time he'd agreed to talk to other people. He'd really come out of his shell with it. Oh, that is absolutely lovely. James, let's go to you next. There you go. Okay. So, um, one of the things that uh, I was telling you about using the planetarium in a different uh, in a different form with the uh, with the African drumming, we had one student who was studying digital arts, and he uh, he had never visited a planetarium before. And I work at a community college, so um, he saw one of our Music 360 shows, and I also showed him the geodesium version of Space Park 360, which we uh, which we got from uh, Loch Ness Productions as part of the. They had done a collaboration with uh, Dome 3D, but. He saw that and it got his wheels spinning as far as what could be possible in his field that he was studying, which is uh, graphic design or graphic arts. So it turns out after he graduated, he went to the University of Florida to study and he got his bachelor's degree in the same field. And then he called me on the phone saying that for his master's thesis, he decided to design a video game that you could play on a full dome. So I said, huh, that's interesting. So he uh, he talked to me about how he was setting it up. So I said, okay, well, when you have your software ready, come by the planetarium and I can connect you to our digital projector that we have and you can test it out. And he set it up so that not only did he have uh, a Wi-Fi server where we could connect to it on our cell phones and then we could each be one of the characters in this game. And he made it basically like asteroids where you could uh, be one of the spaceships and you have all these asteroids flying through that have been three-dimensionally rendered on the dome and then you just uh, you play asteroids and the one who gets the most points wins. And a lot of us in uh, immersive uh, education know that there are ways that we're interacting with our students, particularly with Psydome and Psy Touch uh, that Spitz offers. And then a lot of the other... Um, the players on the field, uh, in the planetarium field, they all have their interactive uh, media, and I thought the way that they can interact with the students. And I thought it's interesting that a student who was inspired by their visit to the planetarium was able to take it on his initiative to go ahead and do something very similar where you could play a video game. So he's come up with a second one that he's going to come by and test out uh, later on this um, week. Um, but he did get his master's degree and he defended his thesis uh, in our planetarium, which I thought was kind of cool. It's probably the first time that his master's thesis has ever been defended, in a, at least in our planetarium. Carolyn, have you ever heard of Loch Ness Productions? Is that something new to you? Is it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard of him. Yeah, he's just really cool. Just really cool we have a guy here in Colorado that's kind of doing the same thing, but with the whole war game. <laughs> Dave, I see that you had a a one sentence hop in that you wanted to follow up with on James before we. I want to know if he takes. I want to know if he takes requests. I want Duck Hunt three hundred and sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, I'm a video game nerd. Once I get done with you all, I'm gonna go play. I've got a uh, Sega Saturn emulator, and I'm gonna be playing some Sega Saturn after this. I love old school games. If I would love to play one on a big screen like that. <laughs> Dan, we're gonna go to you next, and I will let you know Abigail is still watching. So if you want to give her some oh, love there, you're more than welcome. That was actually I, I, I typed in the private chat that I have. I narrowed down my experiences of like my memorable experiences down to two because I have many. Abigail was one of them. I was going to say, anytime you can name drop Abigail Bolenbach, you do it. Uh, she was just a gem to work with. Uh, if, if, for those who don't know her, she, you know, she was, uh, I believe it's uh, one of the 25 under 25 for NASA. Uh, just fantastic to work with her. Mars Generation. Mars Generation. That's the way. Yeah, that was it. Um, and uh, just anytime I can, and just working with her uh, and her expertise and, and just being that young and then just, just knowing that that's that, the future is there. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Uh, I I got sort of distracted with the last conversation. Can we get missed uh, and the dome? Yes, 
can we get was... missed? Oh my god, can we get missed? That would be the best thing That's ever. Missed nice. is perfect I for the show. That. Who, okay, so how do we I get this that. done? <laughs> how do we get this done? How do we get so so I'll James? I'll figure it out. I'll figure okay, it out. Okay, so listen, I, I am up for a road trip or a plane trip to get with this group and play Mist. One, because <laughs> when was the last time you played it? And now that you've mentioned it, I'm going to download it for Saturn. So thank you. I might okay. play that a little bit later tonight and drive myself That's crazy. Right. <laughs> Something is you know, I, I want to see you do Uru on there, too, because that's a pretty nice environment. <laughs> so, Dan, I want to go back to you with your second story. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Mist would be us. Anyway. Uh, my second example of just um, memorable students or events, I, I got to go with my man Caleb here. Uh, he was, I think it was the first year we opened. Uh, so I guess this is now nine, ten years ago when Jinx Planetarium opened. And so we were just starting this idea of student-produced uh, stuff. So everything was brand new. So this was a student that was just into, he wasn't so much into astronomy, but he loved programming. And so I introduced him to ATM4. And uh, he was my first student programmer for our first show that we have ever created. And uh, great programmer, absolute. Uh, just, he had The part about programming is, yeah, a, a lot of people can learn programming. He had a lot of good programmers, but he also had the creativity along with it. He knew why he needed a program such. And, and you guys know this is definitely part art, too, going with the music, going with the narration. And he had that. Uh, but the success story that came afterwards is after he graduated, he actually ended up getting a job at Tulsa Air and Space Museum and then worked there while he was going to college. And so just to see that somebody goes from, you know, my little high school planetarium here and learns everything, goes over to uh, goes over to a neighboring Tulsa Air and Space Museum. And he was programming shows for them, uh, teaching a lot of uh, at Tulsa uh, Air and Space. He was teaching them a lot just to know that he had the courage and, and the expertise to be able to do that one. So, so awesome. Uh, so, Liz, you want to go next? If I can, if I can find, my, find my mute button. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess memorable. I keep losing track of that thing. Um, most memorable experiences. So, actually, something Carolyn said about um, kids being kind of afraid of the dark and, and maybe um, a, a little wary of the environment made me think of a story where... Um, we there was we had a show um, and there was only going to be one mother and daughter coming to it and, and no one else and um, so okay and the little girl was just like terrified of the environment she just did not want to we have a long entryway and she was going up into the dome and even though the lights were on she just was like petrified and did not want to go in there so I said you know you don't want to force it just um, um, you know, take your time. You can stay down here. Do you want to go in and just kind of peek around the corner? And no, 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 she just didn't want to at all. And um, so I let, you know, mom talk to her for a little while. And then a lot of time was going by. But, you know, we had a lot of time because there's nobody else for the show. I peeked around the corner and I'm like, are you doing OK? Do you want to come see what's in there the little girl was like no 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 and i said do you want to come i can come turn on the stars and you can see what that's like and as soon as i said turn on the stars she just kind of like stopped and her eyes got all wide and she said you can turn on the stars oh. and I said, yeah i can and she was like like how and i said well i can come show you and then she like just she didn't say anything and bolted up the hallway and just bolted straight into the dome and stood at the bottom of the theater, which she just was like adamant. She wasn't going in there. It was at the bottom of the dome and she just looked around and was like, like how? <laughs> and I said, we have a, a theater that spans two floors. And I said, well, you got to go up the stairs and the computer console, the controls are like way up top. And she goes, okay. And she just bolted up the stairs and i was like trailing behind her and it was like she knew where to go which was the really weird thing she went straight up the stairs pulled out the chair at the console sat down grabbed the mouse and this girl's like six years old <laughs> grabs the mouse and then she's like okay what do i do and i was like uh, okay you press this button and she brought on the stars and she was just amazed and i just remember how excited she got and we spent since they were like the only people that had that half hour, we just spent time bringing up 
summoning certain planets and whatever she was interested in. And she not only got over the fear of the room, but she got her own private, um, you know, tour of space and she just loved it. And that was one of the most memorable um, experiences I had in there. Oh, uh, who would like to go next? Mike, Dave, who wants to go? Dave, you're being hidden by your name right now. So we'll go with Mike first so you can sit up since apparently you decided to chill a little bit more. So uh, Mike, we'll go with you first, sir. <laughs> I think you might be muted. Let me check. You got to unmute yourself. Thank you. You remuted. See what had happened was. <laughs> Is that better? Is that there better? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just a, these are incredible stories that, um, you know, this will, uh, it just pays dividends, um, you know, further down the road. And I tell students today, you know, times are tough now, but they've, they've been tough before. I mean, when I was a kid, you used to have to play, play and, and record at the same time if you wanted to record something. You know, so we, we managed to uh, land on the moon and also like your favorite song on the radio, better. waiting up till 3 a.m. So that way you can be like, come on, kiss from a rose, play it next. Right. And I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, my, my mixtape, when make a mixtape. Um, so, so yeah, th these are just fantastic stories. And, and I, I think this is one of the greatest things that, that we can do as planetarians is, you know, no educator in the world can't, you can't teach curiosity. You can't teach passion, but what you can do is you can resonate what's there and what could be more primal than looking up at the stars and wondering about your place among them. And uh, that's the experiences we give, uh, our uh, we try to give then also the uh, our students and, and, and then also the public. And, the and it doesn't have to be just, just in the planetarium. We can I mean, you say you can't teach elsewhere. curiosity, but I think Bob eckford would say that you absolutely can teach so for those that don't know, he's one of the people that worked on Curiosity. Uh, Dave, we'll go to you next. <laughs> so, uh, one of the coolest things that has happened for me and my planetarium over the last few years is through the work that we were doing, um, you know, we were charging, you know, a small fee to enter uh, for our public planetarium shows as a donation um, in the goal of trying to build an observatory on our, on our campus and where we have our telescopes. And uh, it was so well received that our, our local grant ed foundation um, decided to fund it for us. And in fact, it's, it's very close to being finished and we will have not only an observatory, or I should say not only a planetarium, but an observatory on the campus, uh, both of which will be open to the public. So um, that's been a five-year project for me and it's, it's amazing. Uh, the level of support that we've gotten from our community. So, so uh, I have to say that's, to say that's probably the biggest thing that has happened, that for, us. happened for us. Um, did I forget anybody? I don't think that I did, but I think everybody's given their stories. Am I correct on that? Scott? You mind if I add something? You absolutely can. Um, yeah, I have, you could, there are countless stories of individual uh, students and individual kids and individual adults that you, you have those moments with, as everyone said. But uh, in, you know, right um, in this period before the pandemic and then carrying over into virtual programming, uh, last year I had a, a young lady come in for, it was her birthday, and her parents, said, we, we have a little birthday thing that we, we do for uh, someone if they let us uh, know in advance. But she came in dressed up in a, you know, an astronaut uniform. I think she was like eight or so. And um, she came in to watch a, a show we had about Mars. And uh, afterwards, uh, uh, she was had a lot of questions. So I said, can you give me a minute? I started the next show. I went over to my office and I, I also have the, the privilege of curating a very large meteorite collection. And I, I just took nice. a little rock out and dropped it in her hands. And I said, here. And I said, do you know what you're touching? And she's and she's no. I said, well, you're actually touching Mars. And, uh, you know, she's my new best best friend, obviously now. And um, she actually joined us as sort of a guest questioner uh, for her next birthday, which was in the middle of the virtual programming. And uh, we have a deal that, you know, she was required now to go to school and try to be an astronaut. Um, and so, you know, that, that's very memorable. But also, I was mentioning before, we had a rap artist come in and we packed the place for an actual album drop. And... Um, 
it's sort of like, uh, you know, it was great graphically and musically and everything, but it's sort of like, wow, this is in a planetarium. The greatest thing though about that was the following weekend, uh, I counted no less than 50 families where dad or mom had been there for that, that album drop dressed up to the nines, you know, think, you know, out for a party. They were there being mom and dad bringing in their kids. And just that incredible, that edu that, uh, you know, edutainment environment that we have that just sort of highlighted that for me of, of the power of, of being able to, to do one thing and then pay off in bringing families in with the kids, getting them interested in space. I love it. And, uh, you know, so uh, for me, uh, I'm really excited. There's a, a plan in the works for a discovery center to have one in the future. And uh, when I sat down a year ago with the with CEO, he asked me, um, you know, before he brought me on what I wanted to do, I'm like, well, I want to go to CU Boulder. I want to get my degree in astronomy. And then I want to come back and, and run the planetarium that I hear that, that you all might be, might, might be creating here. And he just very excited, hopped up and grabbed his laptop to show me the, uh, show me the pictures of, of what the future uh, discovery center is going to look like. And, um, uh, convinced me that I could go ahead and start the job there. Now I didn't have to wait. And, uh, it was a really exciting moment. I'm really, I really can't wait to be a part of that. I've got so many friends that, uh, that do these things and I know how much it connects, um, with them, uh, and what they're able to do. And I think the big question really kind of is, is that for each one of you, I definitely want to get to all of you on this one before we do, uh, um, our final, our final thoughts is, uh, you know, why, why does it seem that astronomy, um, space in particular has this ability to connect in ways that other sciences can't. Like biology can be really exciting, but it seems like you have to pinpoint one piece of it. Like, oh, Jurassic Park came out, now everybody loves dinosaurs again. But it seems like people are always fascinated by all parts space, especially if you get them out and you know have them look up in dark skies. So what is it for you that uh, excites you the most about this and makes you think that, you know, this, why, why this thing, why astronomy, and uh, why is it so powerful? Um, so anybody wanna go first on that one? Kat, we'll go with you and then we'll go around. Yeah, so I think astronomy is such a powerful science because it is the oldest science. We share the sky with everyone else on this planet, and our ancestors looked at the same exact sky and used it as a tool to guide their lives for various reasons. Um, we often don't connect with it, and I try to do this in the planetarium all the time, is I'll connect it to our history. Every clock, every calendar, every holiday that we have can be tied to some kind of astronomical, either phenomenon or timing. And it's so rooted in our culture in very subtle ways, I think that it just brings that instant connection for people, even if they're not very scientifically engaged it's very powerful for them. Wonderful, wonderful answer. Uh, anybody want to go next? Uh, James, go. And I see you had a story too. If you want to throw that in there while you're while you're sharing this, I missed that. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, it's, uh, to follow up on Kat said, it's one of those things that we share with our ancestors. And astronomy is one of those sciences that you can participate on any level. Uh, unlike chemistry, where mm, I guess the best you can do with chemistry on amateur level is like cooking because <laughs> when you cook something, that's kind of a chemistry experiment. But when you're dealing with astronomy, you can be an amateur astronomer out in your backyard, just looking at things that are fun and interesting, like lunar conjunctions of the planets, or you can become a professional astronomer and work in either observatory or do research or in a planetarium. Uh, but you can, there's a huge spectrum of participation in astronomy, which is very unique for our field. And uh, one of the things that I liked most about working with Jack Horkheimer is the philosophy of the original, the show that he created was called Star Hustler. Um, they changed the name in the 1990s once the internet came along, because if you did searches for Star Hustler, you wouldn't get what you thought you wanted to get. <laughs> so they... Um, they changed the name to Stargazer, Jack Horkheimer Stargazer, because a lot of teachers are starting to use it as part of their curriculum. So, but one of the things that he always wanted to stress with the show was that he was trying to get people to get outside and look up at the sky, because that's one thing that we have gotten away from, primarily in the 20th century and, of course, the 21st century, is because we have streetlights now, and that washes out so much of the sky 
um, that most people don't even know what <laughs> what the sky really looks like. Um, my brother uh, lives in, well, he lived in Miami. He's moved away from Miami. But when Hurricane Andrew came through over 20 years ago, he said that was the first time he'd ever seen the Milky Way. And Jack Horkheimer told a story about that, too, where the police department was getting phone calls and so forth after the hurricane came through because all the lights in South Florida were out um, for some time. People were saying, what is that, ba that, that cloudy band of light going up into the sky? And I was like, uh, that's the Milky Way. <laughs> no one, probably no one in over 100 years had seen the Milky Way from downtown Miami. But it's quite a, you realize how disconnected this generation and uh, this particular generation of humans has gotten from our love of the night sky. I mean, that's a wonderful point. And I've heard the, a similar story about Los Angeles where something happened and I think somebody thought that it was like a, a new, like an attack of some sort, like they were being gassed. Like, what's that cloud in the sky? And it's the Milky Way, man. <laughs> so um, I will go, uh, let's see, we got Mike. Mike's going to go next for us. Yeah, so, yeah, so just to echo just some of the wonderful comments that have been said already, uh, astronomy is really a common denominator of wonder. Whether you bring in a two or three-year-old or an, or an 80-year-old, uh, the sense of wonder when you look up at the sky is is the same. So you have something to work with there that you might not have in other in other sciences or in other topics. Um, also, there's a, a kind of wonderful um, synergy that occurs if you look at our ancestors looking up into the constellations and then imbuing anthropic uh, drama onto the constellations. There is a real connection to us and the stars. The fact that we are stardust. So there's a kind of a, an ironic twist to that when we when we learn about stars in in the modern day, and lastly, you are made of star stuff. You are, and, uh, <laughs> and 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 if you hate someone, you can say you're stellar ash if you if you don't want to if you don't want to imbue them with stardust. <laughs> uh, but uh, the final thing I would say is is astronomy is something that really has underscored the reach of science. Uh, if you go back to the work of Galileo and Newton, it was the first time that we could extend the physics that we understood on Earth to having a cosmic uh, implication, and then eventually, of course, to the work of Einstein. And even if you don't care about black holes and gravitational waves and quantum mechanics, we use this every day when we use GPS and cell phones and all the technology that we have today. So, so it's one of those things that it's hard not to find uh, someone who could be interested in some aspect, some of, aspect that. of that. Love it, love it, love it. Kirlin, I think you were next. Yeah, I was thinking here, you guys were talking about what got me started in it. And aside from my dad taking me out and looking at the stars when I was about four, you know, to me, it was this sort of sense of untouchableness. They're very cool little things up there in the sky, and I can't touch them. Um, after a while, I got to realizing, I think, you know, we tend to teach science in these sort of chunks. You have to take a biology class, you have to take a geology class, you take physical science in ninth grade, and you might get a little bit of astronomy. But after a while, and I think probably this hit me when I was in graduate school, was that it's really the gateway science to so many others. And I know someone else mentioned that, that you really can't understand everything about astronomy and astrophysics without having a little bit more knowledge about chemistry and biology and and planetary science it all comes together in this in this one set of knowledge that astronomy gives you the the doorway to go into so i, I think that's one of the wonderful things about it and with the new technologies we have in the dome now you can certainly bring in visualizations and stories that take you into the kinds of things that you want to teach with astronomy that that are beyond just oh okay there's that constellation and there's that planet to what made them and how do they make, how did they get made and what was their history? And we can illustrate that now. So that's, 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 that's kind of where I am with that. Love, love, love it. Dan, we'll go to you next then, uh, Dave. Yeah. The, uh, uh, Caroline said it wonderfully there. I, I think probably just going to say the same with the different words, I guess in my head, but to me, the, the thing about it, she mentioned that, you know, biology, chemistry, and physics, these are classes that they take. And I, I, and I'm going to use the word tangible uh, to explain it, but I know that's not the best word for it. But those three are tangible. They, they, they are, people can understand them a little more. I think the reason space is so intriguing is because it's the one that, I guess, has the most open space that we don't know about. But didn't mean to pun, but 
it, it, it's just it, it it's just too vast and so much and we can't tangibly touch it uh, it is only visual uh, there's very little we can touch i mean yeah you can touch the telescope but the telescope is actually looking at something you can't uh, but everything else seems to be tangible, and this one's not. So I think that brings almost the group curiosity, and that's what I think this draws Love people it. into this. Dave, time. Cosmo Safari, hit us. Um, um, just kind of riding on that, I think that you know people are inherently curious, and you know we are also travelers. We started off as hunter gatherers, and you know we explored the continents we got through all the usable space we sailed the oceans you know we are on the cusp of uh that next ocean and i'm excited to see what the next you know 100 years brings i think that we will start to populate our solar system and you know i think people are intrigued by that and the fact that it is the most ancient of sciences and it has been uh, hanging above us uh, for all of human history, and, and everyone has access to it uh, to some degree, whether or not their light pollution is is in, impeding on that or not. But I think that that curiosity, that that drive to explore, um, is something that is kind of built into the human experience and so i think to be able to look up there and say we need to go there um might be a big part of that okay well i think um i have much to add beyond what everyone else has said but uh, i think dave said it perfectly when he's talking about all of the it's it's one of the last unexplored places and it's really just the mystery of it all and it is accessible to every everybody you're regardless of what your age is where you what your situation is in life it is there above everybody and all you have to do is step out and look up and and it's that mystery of just what is out there and it speaks to something that's fundamental in all of us our curiosity to know you know we have to know what's around that corner and what's over that hill and we want to know what's beyond that horizon and what is out what is out there and there's all this crazy phenomenon um it's just mind-boggling to try to even think about um when you want to go to like black holes and 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 is there life on other planets and those things just really capture people's imagination and i think inspires and connects well, everybody Scott. well i stand at the junction between the dinosaurs and space right so as an impact uh geologist uh you know, I'm nice. not an astronomer, um, I, but I mean, what what's more exciting than things falling out of the sky and killing dinosaurs? Um, so, you know, that's that's why I have uh, the big impact programs and everything that I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, I often when I start all of our um, uh, presentations, I always ask people, you know, what it is that I do. I say, you know, do you know what a planetary geologist is? And I usually get, uh, you know, hundreds of blank looks. And so I get, I, you know, the sort of the subterfuge of getting into a planetarium is I get to those people coming in to look at the stars and the planets and, oh, yeah, but those people who actually are involved in running those robots and space missions out there to Mars and Venus and, and, and the moon, um, yeah, those are geologists. And uh, people just sort of look at me and, and I think I'm doing service to my science, <laughs> my, my base science. Uh, in uh, in making people realize that, and ultimately, really bringing the all of the all the disciplines together, which is what's what's going to be the uh, critical for these uh, explorations that we're doing over the next decades. Love it. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to give uh, final thoughts to everybody. Mike has uh, said that he would like to go first. So, um, final thoughts: where people can find you on social media, email, websites, anything you want to share with us uh, as we wrap up, and we'll go to everybody on this one. Yep, you can uh, reach me at stamatikos.1 at osu.edu if you want to continue the conversation. And I just want to give a final thought as follows. Uh, when I start my cosmology course, I give two slides to the students, and I tell them we spend the rest of the semester figuring it out. The first one talks about the story of the Big Bang, roughly 14 billion years old, the age of the universe, and how we think we understand that. The second one is more um, compelling, which is a pie chart that shows with all the majesty that we can render with all the satellites and all the planets and all the data that we have, 
we still know less than 5% of what the universe is really made of. And this speaks to things like dark matter and dark energy. So our theories are incomplete. And for as much as we think we know, there's a lot more that we need to know. And that is the, the promise of horizon forever, this horizon of discovery, if we follow the scientific method. I love it. And next we will go to, let me find who went here. Uh, James, we're going to go to James next. James, let everybody know where they can find you as well as your final thoughts, sir. Okay. So you can find me on YouTube at James Albury, the sky above us. Uh, or if you do just do a search for the sky above us, you should find, you should find at least one of the episodes there. And uh, we'd love you to subscribe. Uh, and then, Let's see. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I have a Facebook page, which was the original fan page for my Stargazers identity. So James Albury uh, Stargazer fan page. But I have created a group for the sky above us. And I have my personal uh, page, James Albury one, I think it is on Facebook. So I'm out there. Literally, I guess, with space and all that. Um, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> as far as a final thought, uh, I'd like everybody to always think of how we are connected to the universe. Because that's one of the things that Jack Horkheimer's show, Child of the Universe, did for me when I was 13 years old. Because the premise of the show was the more we learn about the universe, the less significant it can make us feel. Uh, because we, when Galileo and Copernicus and those were starting to show that, you know, Earth isn't really at the center of the universe. We are just one planet orbiting a star. And then as we learned more and more, it was like, okay, well, the sun is not really a significant star. It's fairly small. And then our galaxy is not the only galaxy. And it looks like a lot of the stars in our galaxy have planets just like we are. So it makes us feel smaller and smaller and smaller. But in reality, we should really take that and consider ourselves very precious because even as Carl Sagan said, our obligation to survive is owed not to ourselves, but also to that cosmos ancient and vast from which we spring, which is one of my favorite quotes by him. It was the last thing he said in the series, but um, I always want us to have that connection between the universe and ourselves, and we should really appreciate the fact that we can, as Dan said, we can tell so much about astronomy and we can't even touch the stuff. Everything that we've learned about astronomy has been through observation and then uh, mathematical manipulation of data that we see. Stellar, stellar stuff. And next we're going to go to Dave. Dave, hop in, man. Give us your thoughts. So uh, my name, once again, I'm at cosmosafari.com and uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, uh, YouTube, um, Instagram. I'm, I'm everywhere just as Cosmos Safari. Um, my final thoughts are I pulled this together with Ron tonight to highlight a need, which is do everything you can to support your local museums and planetariums. These amazing people are doing their best to make content available to you. Support them in any way possible. And... Uh, Make sure that they're there for you, us when we all can safely return. And uh, Kat, we'll go to you next for your final thoughts. Yeah, actually, I want to bounce off what J uh, what Dave just said, um, that we are able to do what we're able to do because of our communities. Most of us, that's where we get our funding. That's where we get our visitors. And you don't have to necessarily make a donation to support us, even just spreading the word about planetariums and what they mean to you and sharing your experiences goes a long way to be able to help uh, us further our mission and sustain ourselves. We can use those testimonies in grants and things like that. So even just spreading the word is a huge help for us right now. Agreed, agreed. Uh, Scott, we'll go to you next, sir. Looks like you're muted, sir. Yeah, our our entire science center and our planetarium and our uh, observatory, uh, you can find uh, information about all those at uh, uh, www.fernbank.edu. And then uh, for our virtual programming and for more information, 
we have a uh, Facebook uh, at Fernbank Center where you can actually find our, uh, our virtual uh, live planetarium programs that occur um, at seven o'clock on Friday evenings, Eastern time. And, uh, and on um, uh, one o'clock on Saturdays, uh, Eastern time, I do uh, what I call the planet Arium show, which is a tour through the solar system. And, uh, and then also we have a, a companion uh, site now that is a, uh, uh, Facebook at uh, um, Fernbank Earth Space, and I do a um, um, programming on Mondays, Tuesdays, and and Thursdays where it's just like a series. The first, the ones on Mondays are all about I call it space rocks, all each uh, planet in turn, uh, details about those for about thirty minutes uh, for those you know all the school kids out there or the public. And uh, on uh, the Tuesdays, it's all about geology and rocks. And on Thursdays, we take virtual field trips uh, all over the uh, all over the world. So if you uh, want to yeah, access that content, access please, that content do. please do. And uh, again, yeah, thank you for having me tonight. For having me tonight. It's been great, Carolyn. We'll go to you next. Well, you can well you can find me at facebook.com the space writer slash the space writer. And I also have a website called thespacewriter.com. My company is lochnessproductions.com. And the last thing that I want to say is starting in March, about the 15th, we started watching all of our, our friends in the planetarium community shut down. It was like watching lights go off under the dome. And it's been a long, slow process. One by one, there's opening up like Liz's, you know, she can let 45 people in. They're, they're very slowly opening up. And it, it's just felt to me like this, big gaping hole in our in our cultural landscape of these places not being able to be open. So I do want to echo that those of you out there who go to your planetariums, please support them. Please use what they're giving you uh, for free across their websites. And remember that they're there because when all this is over, they'll still be there and they'll still need you. And I would like to see all of my friends and colleagues back doing what they love to do. Love it. Liz, we'll go to you next and Dan, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with you. Um, I guess I... Uh, you can find me, I don't have a huge social, social media presence, but um, you can find me at uh, the South Carolina State Museum's Facebook page or YouTube channel. Um, I do virtual sky tours every two weeks, um, five to 10 minutes long, and they are posted there. And they um, come, they get released on Thursday evenings. Um, but as for parting thoughts, um, I would say if you have never been to a planetarium or maybe haven't been to a planetarium in a long time and, and one nearby is open, consider going, going to visit one um, because of, I keep running into people who have either never been in there, they have this preconceived notion of what it is or isn't, or they've been there once and they've think that well I've seen the planetarium show I've 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 experienced that I don't I don't need to go back um, but I don't think a lot of people realize what we've been talking about here and what Kat mentioned that we do lots of different things and we're interdisciplinary and we're always looking for new and creative ways to connect with the community um, in various ways so there are live music performances under the stars there are art shows or full dome art shows, laser shows. There are history programs um, as well as astronomy and geography and, and stuff about climate. And there are lots of different things. So if you haven't been ever or in a long time, definitely check out your local planetarium and, and go pay them a visit when they're open. Indeed. If you haven't been to, a, to one in a long time, uh, things have changed. If, if you were a kid, uh, museums and stuff are not what they used to be. You can see all the heads that are nodding now. Uh, it was a game changer for me when I first walked into Perot Museum. When I first saw Perot Museum as I came around the corner going to downtown Dallas, I was like, well, that's got to be the art museum. I'm like, no, that's Perot. And that it's just these things are stunning what, what can be done now. Um, so, and uh, 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 sorry, Dan, I want to go to you next for this. Uh, but yeah, go check these people out. They're amazing. Yes, please do. Everybody here, the panel's been fantastic. Visit those sites. Uh, I, too, like Liz, actually don't have too much of an online presence. We do have a Facebook page, but uh, mostly uh, I, I just offer my email. Uh, it is there in the scrolling bottom there. Uh, and the reason I do that is because most of the, the best ideas I've had for shows, the best scripts have come out of the audience and people who come to visit. 
Uh, Abigail's one of them. Well, I would have never met Abigail. She just didn't come to one of our uh, astronomy nights here. And that rolled into meeting her, getting the idea, writing a script. And now we got a great planetarium show. And again, I, I, it wasn't my idea. I get most of my ideas, most of my inspiration from the audience, from the curiosity that comes into the doors. So the more you guys uh, visit your local planetariums and science centers, the more we're inspired to just do it better and better for you guys and just keep the education going for everyone. And uh, I mean, thank you. Uh, thank you once again to everybody. And listen, we've always got amazing things going on at the Discovery Center here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. You can go check out um, the website, discoverspace.org. Um, we're doing a bunch of stuff for World Space Week. We're getting ready to launch Space Symposium 365, which will be online. We have education programs. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the NOAA Science on a Sphere. If you've never seen one, it's incredible. It's this 55 pound carbon fiber ball that hangs from a ceiling. And it's got uh, four projectors, and those projectors throw images onto it from NOAA and NASA. We can show you hurricanes that were happening up to three hours ago, and we can also show you all this amazing, all the amazing things in our solar system, and a little bit of beyond with uh, with some of the uh, the artists' um, in, impression and. In, in, uh, some of the artist impressions that we can put on there. So there's some really cool stuff you can see. Please go and visit all these people. Anybody um, that uh, is in your local community um, that you want to reach out to. Uh, museums are a great one. So are your local astronomical societies. There's so many ways to connect to the night sky. And uh, they're all out there. And it's a lot of wonderful uh, people just like the people that were on tonight. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Don't forget we do this every single Saturday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. So we can't wait to see you then. <laughs> Dan's giving all the points. <laughs> and check Dave, out da <laughs> Dave, has, Dave has something. Dave, Dave had something. Ron, I just want to encourage you. To Ron, I just want to encourage you to keep keep striving to be interested in running a planetarium someday. Watching you over the last six months, I can tell you, you would you would just uh, be amazing at it. So I can't wait to see when you get. Well, everybody here will be opening. invited. We're gonna have, uh, we're definitely gonna have a big one for that. So we actually, so it's right now we're at about seventeen thousand ish square feet. We just bought the building next door, which is somewhere between like eighty and ninety thousand square feet. So it won't be just be a planetarium. It'll be where we can do shows and stuff. I think we've talked about possibly doing like some smaller type events, like TEDx style talks and stuff. Uh, so we're we're excited for it. And of course, you know, a, a bunch of people always come and see us out here uh, for space symposium. So if you do, make sure we're only 15, 20 minutes up the road. Come and see us. Uh, and we appreciate everybody once again for joining in with us tonight. And we will see you all next week. And thank you so much for another amazing show. Bye everybody. <laughs>